everyone. Thank you for joining us today on behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD. I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Aline Serfari and I'm here with Dr. Hilary Humans, who coordinates and moderates this series with me and with our guest speakers, Drs. Hansa Alzai, Dr. Bianca Guedes, Dr. G. Guen, and Dr. Eron Verne. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, which is ocadmsk.com, and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community, consider registering on the OCAD website. You can do it here on Join Now. And if you click here, you will, will you'll be able to register. It's easy. Wait, one uh, more thing. Go to the bottom. Scroll to okay. the bottom. Okay. We we'll have this just archives. This just archives the uh, cases that are shared through the online uh, email forum, which is a Google group. So if you um, register for access to the website, scroll to the bottom and include your email if you want to uh, see the cases that are shared in the forum. Yeah, so it's easy and you can do it when we finish the session, whenever you want. Anyways, this session will focus on pediatrics. The speakers will present their cases and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions at any time during the presentations, please put them in the chat box and at the end, the speakers will respond to them. Just a quick reminder, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. Unauthorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you for your understanding. And with, with that, I will kick off the session. I'm kicking off, right? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Great. Yeah, you got the session today. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hilary Yeomans. It's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Ji Nguyen, who is the director of musculoskeletal imaging and a visiting prof um, and visiting professor program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and she's an assistant professor of radiology at the University of Pennsylvania. She received her medical degree from the University of Chicago and completed a diagnostic radiology residency at the University of Wisconsin. So she has been all over the United States. That was followed by a pediatric radiology fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which we call CHOP, and a musculoskeletal radiology fellowship at my alma mater, the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. She additionally holds a master's in developmental neurobiology from the University of Chicago Division of Biological Sciences. Her clinical and research interests have focused on the use of novel and quantitative bone and cartilage imaging te techniques to better understand how tissue physiolog physiology changes during development both in health and response to disease. Okay, Jay, please uh, share your screen. Thank you, thank you so much for the, um, for the introduction and thank you for that invitation. Okay. Great. Is my screen shared? Yeah. Perfect, okay, well, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna propose the index case. Um, a two-year-old adopted boy, so no history, presents with mild varus deformity. So you can see an AP radiograph of the knee. We see that the abnormality is centered in the medial aspect of the distal femur. Subsequently, we end up getting an MRI. On the MRI, we can see that there is hypertrophy of the cartilage. There is a growth plate that's receded into the metaphysis. The question is, is there a residual growth potential? And what information do you want to put in your report that is gonna be helpful for um, treatment decision-making? So in order to better understand the growth plate and the residual findings that we see, we have to classify this particular pathology and which area is it mostly affecting? 
So going to the anatomy and physiology, bone formation occurs by both intramembranous ossification, responsible for flat bones like the calvarium, and endochondral ossification responsible for growth of the long bone, which is what we're gonna focus on for this particular presentation. So in the distal femur, we see not only the primary physis, which is also known as the discoid, mm -hmm. for longitudinal growth of the underlying bone, but also the secondary physis that wraps around the secondary ossification center, responsible for, for enlargement of the epiphysis, in this case, the femoral condyle, apophysis, carpal, tarsal, and sesamoids throughout the body. And we like to talk about as our imaging um, is getting better with the 3T and um, better spatial resolution, we talk about this trilaminar appearance. Um, the trilaminar appearance, actually, um, I like to call it the reverse Oreo cookie. Um, you have the growth plate proper, you have the zone of provisional calcification, and then for some cases where the growth plate is very robust, you can see this watery new bone. And this is in the primary metaphyseal spongiosa. So this is not cartilage. Um, it's just, just brand new baby bone. So the growth plate, if we dive deeper microscopically, we see that the growth plate is made up of kilometer chondrocytes. They're organized in these nice little rows and columns where the cells move from the epiphysis to the metaphysis so that the growth of the bone actually goes in the exact opposite direction. Um, this is organized by the res reserve or germinal zone, the proliferative zone, and the hypertrophic zone. The epiphysis on the top, which is different in kids in the sense that we all have the articular cartilage, but in kids we have unossified epiphyseal cartilage, which is vascularized. And then also note that the secondary ossification center, you can see these little red vessels extending into the growth plate. So the growth plate is actually receiving nutrition from the vessels from the epiphysis, which is important because there's no other blood supply. In the metaphysis, you have these N loops that is very, very selfish <laughs> and loops back so that it doesn't give any blood or nutrition to the chondrocytes so that these chondrocytes can undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death and get remodeled, removed, and new bone can be formed in the metaphysis. So putting that together, overall, we have the chondrocytes and columns, we have the epiphyseal vessels that nourish, and then we have metaphyseal vessels that starve the chondrocytes so that it can undergo a, um, apoptosis because it generates this avascular zone. Direct injury is to the physis proper, and that's one that we all talk about, right? We all know this ulcer here is classification. And what actually happens is that microscopically, there is communication between the epiphyseal and metaphyseal vessel. And when this happens, it recruits osteoprogenitor cells coming in here, which over time forms a bar. And depending on the extent of the injury and how much is involved, right, that bar can be bigger or smaller. Here is a 13-year-old female gymnast who presents for follow-up one year post-injury. I'm giving you the normal side and the contralateral, the abnormal side and the contralateral normal side on the right. You can see that there's complete closure, premature closure of the distal radial physis um, involving that central aspect. We see a little displaced ulnar styloid tip fracture as well. So indirect injury, injury that affects the growth plate but does not exactly directly injure the growth plate. And that's the vascularity that we're talking about. So starting with the epiphyseal vascularity, what pattern does that give you? So if you take away the nourishing blood vessels, right? Those chondrocytes are working to death. And um, depending on how severe the, the, the injury is and how little blood it gets, that's gonna determine whether it grows faster or slower or completely just shuts down and closes door. So vascular insult is primarily an insult to the epiphysis. So you will have abnormal epiphyseal abnormality. And then depending on the growth plate, right, the endochondral ossification, it will either grow a little bit, grow a lot, or close. And so over time, depending on the severity of the injury and how long, you know, how long um, post-injury that you have premature physial closure and deformity of that distal epiphysis. Here's a three-year-old boy with left-sided limp. Um, this one's really, really hard and a uh, very good day with lots and lots of coffee. Um, it, it's so hard. <laughs> but because the symptom persisted, um, the clinician ordered MRI. On the pre-contrast images, it's actually hard as well. But the post-contrast, we can all see that left hip, the hip that's symptomatic, have decreased blood supply or almost no blood supply from what we can see. 
So this is important because the arterial supply comes from the medial circumflex artery. But in kids between three to eight years of age, there's no dual supply versus those who are younger than three also receive blood supply from the lateral circumflex. And then greater than eight to 10 years of age receives a little bit of blood from the ligaments and teres. So this is the same patient five years later. We see not only, right, everything's kind of messed up on that left side, but what we primarily see is that the epiphysis is really abnormal in contrast to the other cases. The physis is undulating, irregular, um, areas that are widened, areas that are small. We have a little kind of peak right here where your concern is that kind of prematurely closing. And then the metaphysis, right, which is born from the growth plate is also abnormal because it's downstream from the abnormal growth plane. The metaphyseal injury, on the other hand, gives you a different pattern. So in the metaphysis, if you remove these um, loop vessels, right, you remove that apoptotic signal. So the condos are just hang around because no one's there to clean them up. Um, and so two patterns you see, you see a broad tongue, uh, a broad band, or a focal tongue. Um, these are the two patterns um, for the Purpose of this talk, we can mainly focus on the broad band, which is what we normally see. And this is something that you see day to day, right? Um, so here's a 13 year old gymnast. You can see that distal radial physis is more affected. Um, the lateral, kind of the ulnar aspect of the distal ulnar physis is also a little widened, right? The zone of provisional calcification is not well defined, it's a little sclerotic, kind of appears to be receded into the metaphysis. This is the same patient undergoing conservative management. A nine months later, completely reconstitutes, everything looks normal. So remember, this pattern is different from the epiphyseal injury because the epiphysis looks normal, right? All the injury that we're seeing is in the metaphysis. This is a really nice systemic review. I'm coining this term primary periphyseal stress injury. And Dr. Crane looked at 128 articles, most of which are case reports and case series. But what's most significant with this pattern is that of the 488 patients he identified in the literature, 12.7% had growth disturbance, of which only half undergo surgery, right? This basically emphasizes that what we see clinically, if the injury is mainly limited to the metaphysis, if you undergo conservative management, they actually do fairly well. Only a minority who continue to play um, to be non-compliant end up having long-term deformity that requires surgery. So the deformity pattern um, can reveal clues on what actually happened months, years, late, uh, years before. We have the patterns of metaphyseal injury, we have patterns of physeal injury, and then we have patterns of epiphyseal injury. And so going back to our case, we see that the epiphysis is abnormal, right? That kind of clue us in that it may be an epiphyseal sided insult. And then on the MRI, we see that the growth plate is still there. It's not severe enough to close the growth plate, so there is some residual growth potential. So going back to our little illustration of the different types of injury, we can exclude the first two, right? It's not completely closed. And between the latter two, we see that there is associated epiphyseal abnormality. So therefore it's an indirect epiphyseal injury and not an indirect metaphyseal injury. So treatment depends on anatomic location, anticipated growth and severity of the deformity. The presence and absence of the physis dictates whether there is any residual growth potential. You don't want to sit around when the growth plate has completely closed. And the only way to know is to get the MRI. And so for these patients, we can divide them into those that still have open growth plate and those who have closed growth plate on the right. And the treatment options are these listed that right, your surgeons are considering. You just rest and wait, um, watchful waiting, guided growth, bar resection, or osteotomy. And the ones on the left where the growth plate is present that you identify on MRI, you can do the, the former. And those that have closed, then you have to consider the latter. So that really is helpful to note that how much of the growth plate is still there in your report for the MRI for the surgeon. And location, location, location is everything. Um, in kids, even though, you know, we talk about everything being equal, but it is not equal, right? There's innate growth potential that's different. So for example, in the humerus, the proximal humerus grows, contribute 80% of the growth of the humerus rather than the physis of the distal humerus. And that's important because you're actually walking on your lower extremity, which is weighted higher than the upper, um, the upper extremity. 
So going back to our case, we have identified this is an injury, right? A primary epiphyseal injury. Even though the growth plate looks like it's receded in the metaphysis, it's only because it's growing slower, right? Because the growth is pushing from the metaphysis to the epiphysis. It just means the lateral aspect right here is growing more over time so that this looks receded because it's just not able to catch up. So how much of the blood supply is eliminated? We know it's not completely eliminated from the epiphysis, right? Because we still have an open physis. So we definitely don't want to do bar resection or osteotomy because there's still growth potential. We don't want to sit around and do nothing. So the next option for this particular patient will be getting another MRI in six months and then serial radiograph to see, to just determine the slope of growth that will help them predict when to actually intervene with guided growth, meaning sacrificing the normal side for the abnormal side to catch up. So the take home is to, um, when we talk about the growth plate, it's not just the growth plate itself, but it's also the intact epiphyseal vascularity and the metaphyseal vascularity that forms this growth plate complex. And that is the end of my presentation. Amazing, amazing, thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, our next speaker today is Dr. Bianca Guedes. Dr. Bianca Guedes is a pediatric radiologist at DASA and at the uh, Hospital Municipal Jesus and Hospital Boldrini, which is a pediatric oncology hospital in Rio de Janeiro. She graduated with a degree in medicine from Universidade Gama Filho in Rio de Janeiro and completed a medical residency in radiology and diagnostic imaging at Santa Casa de Misericórdia. She completed a fellowship in pediatric radiology at DASA and a master's uh, degree in radiology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. She's the coordinator of the pediatric study group of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and a member of the Appropriateness Criteria Committee for Pediatric Diagnostic Imaging at the Brazilian College of Radiology. She's also a member of the Latin American uh, Society of Pediatric Radiology and a member of the RCNA. She, she has authored and co-authored peer-reviewed articles and book chapters in pediatric radiology. And she's also uh, very involved in pediatric uh, radiology education having presented at radiology uh, national and international conferences. Please, Bianca, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon for everyone. Firstly, I would like to thank you, Aline uh, and Dr. Hilary Human, for the invitation. So uh, our case is about a nine years old boy presenting pain in the left hemiface for two months that slowly were progressive and not improved with regular analgesic drugs. So he was previously healthy uh, with no progress pathologies. So after almost three months of chronic pain, he also presented mild swelling of uh, left cervical area and worsening of his pain and the ultrasound was performed. So in the cervical and face ultrasound, we see uh, this hypoechoic uh, heterogeneous area with rounded fossae uh, located deep in the left parotid. Uh, Doppler does not show a significant increase in flow through the lesion or the rest of the parotid parenchyma, which has a normal sonographic appearance. So there is also an enlarged lymph node uh, located in the left anterior cervical chain uh, with re re reactive appearance. Uh, the other findings were normal. So uh, many times in emergency, again, he was medicated with anti-inflammatories, anti getting periods of temporary improvement, but he maintained uh, intermittent pain and swelling uh, in the left hand phase, needing many times go back to the emergency emergency uh, emergency room, uh, where new ultrasound was requested. So the new ultrasound showed uh, this thickening and disorganization uh, of the muscle fibers of the left masseter 
associated with uh, irregularity uh, of the left mandible of the bone uh, contour. Uh, there was also an important edematous swelling of the sub subcutaneous tissue. Uh, we also see the hypoechoico heterogeneous area persists, uh, persists uh, just the same in the parotid, uh, left parotid. Uh, but without signs of mumps or uh, specific inflammation of this uh, point. So it was suggested to continue, continue investigation with computed tomography of the face and neck that was uh, made with contrast uh, that showed a volumetric increase in the masseter muscle, uh, the left one, uh, which has a uh, heterogeneous mild uptake uh, of the, the contrast uh, with adjacent fat edema. So uh, there was also bone marrow sclerosis and a well-defined uh, radiolucent areas in between affecting the posterior portion of the body angle and ramos of uh, left mandible. Uh, there was also small solutions of continuity uh, of the external cortical border, notably in the left uh, mandible angle, uh, and also noting periosteal reaction lamina at the cor corresponding cortical edges. Uh, so these findings were suggestive of inflammatory infectious changes. Uh, osteomyelitis uh, was the first um, uh, hypothesis on the left mandible. And when we search on PubMed with the keywords osteomyelitis and mandible, uh, we currently find 36 articles. So we found this type of osteomyelitis that affects the, the mandibular bone, and is related to dental elements that is called Gare's osteomyelitis. That is a, a form of chronic osteomyelitis that commonly affects children and young adult, adults. Uh, signs and symptoms are fasci fascial asymmetry, bony and heart swelling with trismus. Uh, history of infected tooth elements was usually present. So in CT, we can find uh, thickening and sclerosis of the ramus or and condylar process of mandible, uh, proliferative periostitis. In MR, uh, we can find soft tissue edema and inflammation and other findings that I will show you on the next slide. Uh, here on this, uh, this uh, the best article that matches with our case, uh, we see very similar images on CT. Uh, so this contrast enhanced CT shows edemat edematous uh, pterygoid muscles um, and uh, masseter muscle uh, enhancement with uh, a proliferative periostitis on the right mandible that is also showing show, uh, shown in 3D reconstruction. So on this occasion, Gares osteomyelitis was diagnosed. The, treat the treatment uh, was uh, mandibular curatage and removal of uh, germs of uh, germs from 37 and 38, 38 uh, elements. In addition to a long hospital stay, about 30 days with IV antibiotics uh, therapy. And he went home on oral antibiotics for another 10 days. Uh, and after that, uh, histopathological exam was performed, performed uh, with the surgical material and the result was suggestive of just myofibroblastic proliferation with reactive uh, aspect surrounding the newly formed bone tissue, no neoplastic findings, then the culture was negative for bacteria or fungus, uh, but after surgery and the antibiotic treatment, the patient was much better with almost complete decrease of the symptoms. So there is the uh, MRI uh, that was performed two months later. Uh, 
that show persist persistent mild bone marrow edema uh, of the left humerus uh, and angle of the mandible with imprecise limits with a hypo intense um, signal on T1 and contrast uh, uptake associated with uh, continuous solid periosteal reaction being markedly less evident that uh, observed in the previous CT examination. Uh, there was also a reduction in edema of the musculature and uh, adjacent, adjacent soft tissues. So uh, six months uh, six months after the, the first CT, a new, one, a new CT was performed. And here we see an important improvement of that findings. Uh, in this exam, we see only a mild, mild uh, thickening and sclerosis of the left mandibular rumbles uh, without evidence of peri periosteal reaction and no more bone reabsorption. So the patient was also asymptomatic, but another MRI was performed in the same day that showed uh, that this less, uh, the, the, the edema was uh, less important of the bone marrow of the left homo of and, and dango uh, of the left mandible with uh, impressive uh, impressive limits and uh, the hypo intense signal on T1 uh, has, has a discrete uh, a discrete uh, uptake uh, a mild uptake of the contrast medium. Uh, without periosteal reaction in the present exam. So uh, we have no uh, signal of uh, restricted diffusibility diffus 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 and no, lo no longer contrast enhanced edema uh, on the adjacent muscles or, or soft tissues. So uh, there was a radiologic and symptomatic improvement of the patient. And the evolution uh, of this patient was uh, good for two years, but uh, two, years, two years later, the patient reported pain and left ear and the genial region uh, in the left ear and in the genial region on the same side. And he was admitted on the ear once, uh, once again, and that was performed with uh, anti-inflammatories, and he did uh, CT scans and other um, examinations. So, uh, sorry. So he did this uh, MRI that showed the hyposignal area uh, on T1 and uh, hypersignal on T2 and STIR. Uh, contrast enhancement was still here. Uh, in the left uh, mandible, mandible. There was also discrete infil infiltration yet with uh, hyper signal and light contrast uptake of the masseter muscle and less evidence of its uh, pterygoid muscle on this side, suggesting inflammatory infectious process again. Uh, there was no evidence of areas suggestive of collections or restrictive diffusibility again. So uh, there was performed another CT that showed this, uh, uh, the, the thickening of the left mandible uh, humerus uh, with a radiolucent rounded image uh, of about seven millimeters uh, and cortical discontinuity with medullary sclerosis noting even laminar periosteal reaction in the angle and left mandible uh, ramus. So there are more uh, images here. And here we have this lucent area, the tiny one. So a few months later, uh, he referred again perimandibular bulging again. Uh, on the last one, on the last CT, he was not with uh, so much symptoms but now the burgeon uh, was here again. So it is more evident in the current study, uh, the area of bone marrow, edema affecting the vertical branches, 
and the posterior and middle portion of the horizontal branch of the left mandible with marked uh, hyposignal on T1. Uh, there is edema of the surrounding soft tissues and periosteal reaction again, predominantly uh, of the solid and continuous type with uh, continuous uh, contrast enhancement again. There was, uh, however, without evidence uh, of an area of uh, restricted diffusion again. So the impression here uh, was again, signs of inflammatory infectious process on the left mandible with the appearance of a small area suggestive uh, of a little uh, uh, abscess here that is this small uh, oval image uh, corresponding that uh, radiolucent lesion seen on tomography. Uh, then the patient, uh, after more antibiotic and inflammatory treatment, the control MRI showed that the small oval image uh, was uh, no longer observed. And then uh, with the chronic evolution and remission and spontaneous exacerbations, uh, in addition to the negative cultures and laboratory or poor findings, the CRMO hypothesis was uh, suggested. And when we search on PubMed, uh, we have only 21 articles uh, with the keyword osteomyelitis and mandible uh, and CRMO. So, uh, CRMO is a chronic recurrent for multifocal osteomyelitis, is a rare acquired inflammatory, inflammatory skeletal disorder of no uh, origin. So CRMO mainly affects uh, children and young adults of female gen gender, and the CRMO is part of the clinical picture of non-bacterial uh, osteomyelitis, NBO and typically presents a uh, relapsing recurring cause uh, with both remission and spontaneous exacerbation, exactly what, what our patient has. So CRMO is typically encountered in the limbs and in the metaphysis of long bones in particular, but in 5% of the patients can be seen on, uh, in mandible. So it's a idiopathic in the inflammatory bone disorder. Uh, it's a diagnosis of exclusion because uh, however, in some cases uh, we, we have to exclude the infection and neoplasia uh, hypothesis. So it has a female predominance uh, with 85% of cases reported in women, in girls. Uh, typically manifest in the first decade of life. So there is a, a case on this article. We see a very similar findings of our case on mandible. Uh, the CT reviews an extensive, extensive uh, thickening uh, of the left mandible with contrast agent enhances uh, of soft tissue mass. Uh, we have destruction and bone erasions too. Uh, on MRI, we have a soft tissue tumor with infiltration of surrounding bone and located at the left corpus and ramos of lower uh, jar. So uh, on the same article, we see very similar images of uh, the ultrasound that uh, we see on the first, uh, on the beginning of the presentation. So the, the patient was uh, referred to a remote rheumatologist. Uh, laboratory uh, tests had no main findings, no uh, very important findings. Whole body scintigraphy finds uh, uh, of mandible chronic osteomyelitis, no other focal points of hypercaptation. Uh, treatment started with methotrexate and we have improvement of the symptoms and the control imaging uh, of this MRI uh, showed less intense and uh, less of the extensive of the, the, the edema, the bone edema uh, affecting the, the left mandible. 
And we have also the periosteal thickening and reaction uh, is uh, less evident. There are no uh, areas of uh, restricted uh, diffusion or uh, abscess on this time. And we have another CT of control that shows a very significant reduction of the thickening of mandibular ramus, as well in the cortical discontinuity uh, with the uh, radio, radio lucent image uh, is not more, uh, is very uh, much less evident, <laughs> no, uh, with no focal or difficult to, uh, uh, with no focal uh, lesion at this time. So we have here more images with just these uh, bone uh, the, uh, sclerosis, medullary sclerosis. And then the last uh, MRI, uh, the patient one year later uh, presented with swelling and pain again uh, due to medication, so there is intermittent course of this disease. Uh, there is a slight increase in the area of the edema of bone marrow, of left mandible, notable uh, in the vertical branches and posterior middle portion of uh, the mandible, with greater involvement uh, being observed in the most anterior portion uh, on corresponding or horizontal. So the adjacent periosteal thickening and reaction is also more evident in the current study, uh, as well as the contrast, contrast uh, enhancing and tissue uh, thickening and other findings. So in conclusions, uh, we, uh, it's, it's better to know that uh, rare diseases might uh, occasionally present with even more rare symptoms. So CRMO in mandible have already been described and these occasions can be a considerable uh, diagnostic challenge. The knowledge uh, about the disease and its uh, symptoms is a matter uh, of extreme value in such cases. In addition, uh, an accurate uh, medical story of uh, these cases uh, can uh, it's important to uh, know about the, the history and the, the changes of the cranial skeleton. Uh, they are present in these cases. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bianca. Okay. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Hamza Alizai, who's a faculty member at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania. He splits his time between pediatric radiology and MSK imaging. He completed his diagnostic radiology residency at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas, followed by a musculoskeletal radiology fellowship at New York University. He uh, was previously on faculty at NYU, as well as at Scottish Rite Hospital for Children in Dallas, Texas. Okay, Hamza, share your screen. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for the introduction, Hillary, and um, Elaine, thank you for inviting me to um, share a case with you guys. I've uh, selected a case which I think um, you're, you're likely to encounter, um, even if you're not a predominantly pediatric uh, radiology uh, interpreter. And this is a 15 year old with chronic bilateral hip pain. So we've got some radiographs here on the left is an AP pelvis and then frog leg lateral on the right. And, you know, radiographs are always a little bit difficult to interpret um, in PowerPoints, but what we see here is essentially concentric diffuse um, joint space narrowing of the hips bilaterally. Now, if we measure uh, the joint space here, it was measuring between two to three millimeters on, on each side. The other thing we see is subjectively, there's some periarticular dis, um, demilization as well as cortical irregularity at the periphery of the femoral heads bilaterally. 
So we moved on to NMR. And on the left, we have a coronal T1 sequence. In the middle, we have a coronal stir and axial stir images. And then on the right, we have a 3D GRE um, sequence, which has a CT-like appearance. And the, the findings on these MRs are essentially um, synovitis in both hips. We're seeing some marrow and on both the medial and lateral uh, peripheral aspects of the hip, as well as some marrow within the acetabula. Um, the axial images are showing um, similar findings, marrow in the acetabulum, as well as bilateral iliopsoas bursitis. Um, now, if we carefully look at the, the cortex, there are small um, erosions seen in both hips, uh, especially peripherally um, in the left hip. So, you know, we moved on to radiographs, obviously. And if we look at the, these are bilateral radiographs on this 15 year old. And um, in the wrist, there's diffuse pancarpal joint space narrowing. Um, there are erosive changes in both wrists, um, fairly advanced. This periarticular osteopenia in the wrist, as well as at the metacarpophalangeal joints. And similar, a little bit more subtle findings are seen in the midfoot uh, in the midfoot bilaterally. Now, uh, here are MR images of the wrist and hands. So on the left, we have a coronal T1 sequence. Um, on right next to it is a coronal T2 fat set. We have axial T2 fat set images of the wrist and the hand and as well as a star, coronal star image of the, um, of the hand. And again, we're seeing extensive erosive change in the wrist, um, quite a bit of synovitis. Um, on the axial images, there is essentially tenosynovitis involving all the extensor compartments as well as the flexor compartments of the wrist. Um, erosive changes at the metacarpophalangeal joints with uh, marrow edema, and synovitis. And so this is a case of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It's a chronic, uh, the most common chronic arthritis in kids. It's uh, by definition has to be diagnosed before the age of 16. Um, it's more common in, in, in female patients. Uh, it's idiopathic and considered to be autoimmune, autoinflammatory. There are seven subtypes uh, per the International League of Association of Rheumatology. They have seven subtypes, and um, these have been um, re redefined several times over the last couple of decades. But um, there is an it can be an oligoarthritis, which involves four uh, less joints, predominantly large joints um, like the knees and hips and shoulders. Um, there's polyarthritis, which has now recently been divided into uh, RF positive and RF negative um, um, polyarthritis. And so oligoarthritis is the most common. Um, polyarthritis is the second most common, and it typically involves five or more joints. Um, these could be large or small joints. There's systemic disease, which is also um, called still disease. And this involves the entire body and you have systemic symptoms such as fevers and splenomegaly, and this has a more uh, severe course. There is psoriatic arthritis, which can present with or without um, before or after skin symptoms, just like in adults. There's enthesitis related um, arthritis, which includes, uh, which is essentially spondyloarthropathy. And then there is an undifferentiated subtype where there is joint inflammation, but it doesn't meet the criteria for the uh, first six subtypes. Um, and this is essentially the, the pathogenesis of the um, um, GIA. It's a, it's a nice schematic. It's essentially showing that there's an uncontrolled pr proliferation of uh, synoviocytes, which leads to thickening of the synovium and rapid um, pathologic uh, angiogenesis, which together lead to formation of the panis, which is invasive and causes joint destruction. Um, there's also associated accumulation of macrophages, granulocytes, plasma cells, um, which produce inflammatory uh, mediators. And this cascade is just progressive. And so 
Here is a companion case. This is a 10-year-old with chronic neck pain. Um, imaging was performed at outside an institution as over the course of several years, multiple times, and they were all interpreted as normal. Um, now if you look at the, uh, these images are all sagittal stir images. The, the one on the left, we can see some mar focal marrow within the dorsal aspect of the dens. And if we look at it carefully, there's a little bit of um, cortical irregularity along the dorsum of the dens as well. And then the C7 transverse process is diffusely edematous. Um, going a little bit more laterally, on both sides, we're seeing synovitis within the facet joints and marrow on both sides of the facet joints. Um, similarly, there is quite a bit of inflammation in the atlanto-occipital um, joints. And so um, CT images on the same patient, we can nicely see that erosion in, in the dorsal aspect of the dens. And then if we look at the atlanto-occipital joints, they're essentially um, um, fused. They're really narrow. We see quite a bit of erosive change and there is fusion on, um, partial fusion at least on both sides. Even the facet joints, um, the erosions are subtle, but we can see erosive change here at the facet joints posteriorly and the image in, um, to the far right. And so uh, the key point here is that, um, you know, th this is a recent article asking, is spinal involvement in GIA? What do we miss without um, imaging? And what they found is that 53% of uh, patients with enthesitis related arthritis were asymptomatic as far as spine symptoms, but 77% of these had positive MRI findings. And the same goes for uh, the non-ERA patients. 26% were asymptomatic, but 75% of these that were asymptomatic had positive findings on MRI. So um, I want to show you this case because spine involvement is really difficult to detect clinically. Um, symptoms are present in a lot of these patients, especially in the cervical spine, but they're very mild and can be easily overlooked. So there should be a sort of a low threshold for imaging the spine in these patients. Um, the thoracic and lumbar spine are less commonly in involved in, in kids. Um, you know, um, atlanto-occipital and atlanto-axial joints are synovial joints, so these are prone to inflammation, and that's why we'll very commonly see um, MR findings in those locations. And here is another companion case. This is a 16-year-old with uh, jaw pain. And so TMJ MRIs, um, if you're not reading them, I have a um, just a, a image on the right with um, sort of labels, uh, labeling different parts of the, the mandible. The images on the left are coronal images of the uh, coronal stir images of the bilateral mandibles, um, bilateral temporomandibular joints. And then we have closed mouth um, sagittal PD fat side images as well. And what we're seeing here is essentially this hyper intense signals within the joint, surrounding the joint, which is um, synovitis and flattening and irregularity of the mandibular condyle. So you can see erosive change here, which is really nicely depicted on the, the sagittal um, closed mouth PD fat set images. And if you look at this image here on the, the top, the sag PD fat set, the uh, articular disc of the temporomandibular joint is uh, grossly abnormal. It's, it's essentially split in two. Um, and the temporal eminence um, um, as well has marrow edema, um, as well as there's quite a bit of marrow edema within the mandibular condyle. So this is um, temporomandibular uh, joint involvement by GIA. And this is essentially what it leads to. Um, I showed this case um, at a resident conference and someone thought these were the new AirPods, but um, this is temper temporomandibular joint replacement in a, in a teenager. So really debilitating um, involvement um, by GIA. And it's common. It's again, just like the spine, it's uh, difficult to detect clinically. Um, it's seen in 40 to 87% on um, uh, MRI of the TMJs done in these patients. There is an association between spine and TMJ involvement. So if you have one, you're likely to have the other as well. Now the mandibular cartilage, condyle cartilage is the center of the greatest um, 
growth and development in the craniofacial complex. So obviously, if that is affected, the, you know, it leads to really debilitating deformities um, and eventually um, um, TMJ joint replacement, like in the, the case that I showed you. We can use ultrasound to evaluate um, at least the periphery of the joint. Um, these are ultrasound images that, uh, that we performed um, at Scottish Rite in Dallas. And um, not so much for diagnostic purposes. Um, I think uh, it's more useful for ultrasound-guided injections, um, cortic corticosteroid injections, which we performed um, on a fairly regular basis in the, the kids with uh, severe disease. And then lastly, um, I want to show you this case because it's un uncommon, um, but it can mimic uh, GIA. If you, this is a 12-year-old with hip pain, and this child has uh, unilateral hip pain, um, which progressed fairly rapidly over the course of a few months. And these are MR images um, showing essentially diffuse cartilage loss in the left hip, extensive uh, marrow edema within the, the proximal femur, as well as the acetabulum, a large joint effusion, synovial thickening. And I'm showing you, you a coronal sternum image just to um, demonstrate that there was no sacroiliitis. Um, there was initially, a, the thought was that this could be infection. So the bone was biopsied, the joint was drained, uh, the syn synovium was biopsied, and um, there was no evidence of infection. And so this is idiopathic chondrolysis, which you can also see in the adolescent population. It's, a, it's uncommon. Um, the primary um, or idiopathic one is uncommon. You can see chondrolysis, which is essentially a rapid destruction of the cartilage uh, due to other reasons, such as slip capital femoral epiphysis, um, you know, infection, obviously. Um, and when you do see it, it presents with asymmetric, uh, progressive, and rapid loss of joint space. Um, less than three millimeters. And the treatment is aimed at restoration of movement because these hips are really stiff. And unfortunately, a lot of these, we do corticosteroid injections for them. Um, you can see one being performed here in the, the same patient with quite a bit of um, femoral head deformity there and uh, joint effusion synovial thickening. Um, majority of these cases do end up having to undergo arthroplasty, unfortunately. So these, uh, that's all the case, all I have for you today. Thank, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hamsa. That was amazing. Eline. Thank you, Hamsa. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Iron Verne. He specializes in fetal medicine, ultrasound, and obstetric, obstetrics and gynecology. He practiced at Alta Diagnosticos in Rio de Janeiro. He graduated with a degree in medicine from the Federal University of the State of Rio de Janeiro, where he also completed his residency. He completed his fellowship at Université Paris de Cartes and a PhD in radiology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He's a visiting professor in radiology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. USA and a founding member of the Brazilian Academy of Ultrasound, as well as member of the Latino America, uh, Latin America Academy of Ultrasound. Hello, it's a big pleasure to be with you and to be presenting on one case in the MSK case presentation series. My name is Aaron Berner, and I will present to you a very rare case. We received this patient, 34 years old, a pregnant woman, and it was her first pregnancy. And they sent to us to evaluate a cyst near the cervical region. They evaluate, we received that this woman, this pregnant woman, 36 weeks of gestation. What's interesting is that we, you take a look in the, uh, uh, her ultrasound at 21 weeks of gestation, and the, the ultrasound was uh, all normal. So uh, the ultrasound, the view of the ultrasound, we found heterogeneous mass of the fetal neck measuring around 10 centimeters with poor defined boundaries, calcifications, high graminous, 
And the, the, figures, the size of the figure was okay, with 69 percentile and weigh around three kilos. So here you can see the view of the, the, the tumor here, uh, uh, the coronal view, uh, that was the 3D reconstruction in uh, the ultrasound. In this multi-planar view here, you can see uh, sagittal, axial, and coronal. You can see uh, the tumor. Hydramnus is easily to see. And you see the, here the back of the fetus, the big tumor going to the thorax, cervical part, and also hair. And the fetus has the other parts of the fetus were, were normal, and the fetal's face was, uh, 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 was normal. This is a 3D view using the HD live silhouette. And where you can see in this reconstruction the heterogeneity of the mass. You see here the tumor in the sagittal view, so the spine and tumor here, and the same view in the coronal view here, ultrasound at 36 weeks. So we did at the same day MRI. And in MRI, we found the large tumor in, in the soft tissues going to the thoracic region, cervical, and more in posterior of the thorax to the left, with imprecise boundaries and in close relationship with the paravertebral muscles and left axillary spaces. Very filtrative thorax intrathorax component by testing trachea, left main bronchus, and mediastinum. The signal on T2 and T1 was intermediate, but we could find some areas showing T2 hyperintensity and hyperintensity, which could correspond to cystic and necrotic lesions. We found tubular formations in the peripheral areas of the mass demonstrate a possible vascular network. And the measurements were, looks like the same we found in ultrasound about 11 to 9 centimeters in, the, in diameter. So take a look here in the MRI, 36 weeks, the sagittal view showing the tumor here in the back, in the thorax. You go, go into the neck and hair. And look the thin skin here on T2. You can see in this coronal view the tumor here in the neck, and you have infiltrating here uh, invasion and compromised left axillary lymph nodes. And you see easily here the mediastinal shift to the right. In the axial view, you see, you see here the, the heart, the lungs, and the tumor in the back here going to the left. And lymph node infiltration, né? you see the, uh, uh, the thin uh, skin. This is a 3D reconstruction by MRI of the whole fetus. You see the tumor in green, and in red here, you see the, the, the thorax, uh, the invasion here, and the lungs. And see here the airway there. Take a look of here, the size of the tumor. We did a 3D reconstruction. This is a coronal view. You see the tumor in green and the invasion of the tumor to, into the thorax uh, in red. So we did a C-section, 37 weeks, a female baby weighing 3.7 kilograms. The baby was transferred to ICU in function of breathing with difficulties. They did a CT scan day, day two, and they found a mass occupying the fetal dorsum predominantly to the left, same you saw in, in ultrasound and MRI, fetal MRI, in, uh, occupying also the left axilla with a clear connection to the axillary, axillary lymph nodes. The mass penetrating to the thorax through the paracostal space, reaching the left and thorax and bypassing the mediastinum. Suspect the metastatic mass observed in the heteroperitoneal space. It is more visible metastasis uh, in the liver. So you can see here the tumor affect the left side of the chest, stretching the skin and infiltrating to the left arm feet.
é sentir bem tu, de sair de ouvir, de que ele se alguém de tu morria, com de torres, e de air, neck, e em de arte se ouviu, e o que ele se de torres, invasion, e also hear de small liver metástases. Se se hear de invasion, e de met, suspect metástases em de retroperitone. Uh, 36 weeks again, we can compare with the CT uh, day two and the, both 3D reconstruction in coronal view. You can see the tumor in green and the invasion in, uh, in red. So we can compare again the 3D view in MRI, fetal MRI, 36 weeks, and the postnatal. Uh, CT. I think it's very easy to compare both uh, 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 methods. So the evolution after the clinic stabilization, the newborn was transferred to another tertiary unit due to a pediatric oncological disease. The diagnosis was by biopsy, doing we had extrarenal rhabdoid tumor, chemotherapy over two months with mass reduction, but we had some clinical reper repercussions, including tumor rupture, limiting the therapy. The, ba the baby de uh, died at, in the third month, month of life. So tumors in fetal, 1.7 to 13%, 13 in uh, 100 life births. Rhabdoids we divide in three categories according to the primary site of development, renal, central nervous system, and other areas such as chemo, soft tissues, and etc. And mostly is due to inactivation of tumor suppressor and located on chromosome 22. It was a deletion of this gene predisposed children to rhabdoid tumors in the brain and extracranial sites. The first case was, uh, was described by in, in 1978. They used it to uh, consider as a special subtype of uh, Williams tumor, tumor with poor prognosis, uh, but uh, has in 1981 identified this as a different tumor and defined it as a rhabdoid tumor due to the histological appearance of the rhabdomyoblasts. It's little. Uh, uh, we won't find we won't find a lot of children less than 15 years between uh, 1993 and 2010. So the incidence of extrarenal rhabdoid tumor is 0.6 in 1 million children. And one year survival rate is 30, about 31%. So in fetus, the diagnosis is extremely rare, affected both sexes, and it, mostly in the third trimester, this is the diagnosis. And you can find reduction of the fetal movements in hydramnios. And we found this in the, this case. In the differential diagnosis, uh, myofibromatosis, congenital fibrosarcoma, and abdomyosarcoma. So here are some cases related, uh, uh, some serious cases. Uh, you can see mostly the diagnosis were uh, in the third trimester, as we had. The fetal gender, you can find male and female. Most of the cases you find the, the thorax compromise, metastasis in most of the cases, and in some cases, placental involvement, and hydramnios in all of, almost all the cases. The gestational birth here, Around between 32 and 36 weeks, and the survival is very short, you see, in days uh, in most of the cases. I would like to highlight the diagnosis by ultrasound. It's the first line of diagnosis, but I can tell you that MRI can help a lot because MRI has also a very good tissue contrast differentiation, and also MRI 
has a big field of view, which is very good to have an idea about uh, uh, the whole features. We just published this case report in the Journal of Gynecology Obstetrics and Human Reproduction. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure to be with you. Thank you all. Thank you, Veron. And um, I see that the questions uh, that you put on the chat in the chat box, box, Bianca has already addressed. I don't see any other questions here. So thank you all. I want to let you know that we will take a break in December and January while we final, finalize the 2023 schedule. And we will resume in February 2023 with a session focused on sports imaging. So thank you all. Bye. <music>